Old Man River. It is good to see this again. The mighty Mississippi. No matter what else is going on in the world, that river just keeps rolling along. This river has inspired countless works of art, countless old songs, and some of the greatest books ever written, especially by my favorite author, the Mississippi River's favorite son, Samuel Langhorn Clemens. Better known the world over as Mark Twain. Born in the backwoods, he became a Mississippi Riverboat pilot, a silver miner, a traveling newspaper correspondent, a world famous lecturer, and of course, perhaps still America's most beloved author. He was a world traveler and world famous, and his incredible life story all really got started right here along the banks of the muddy Mississippi in what was then the sleepy little village of Hannibal. Now, eventually, Hannibal became a huge railroad and lumber center. And its population boomed, which filled it up with all kinds of historic buildings and more ornate brick old school mansions than you can shake a stick at. Eventually, though, business slowed down, and like many other old towns, particularly in the Midwest, downtown Hannibal kind of became a sleepy village again. So there's a lot of cool abandoned or semi abandoned old buildings existing in various states of arrested decay, like this old jail here, which makes Hannibal a cool place to visit and take photos. But let's face it, as cool as all those old historic buildings are, the main attraction is down by the river. It's this little house right here, the boyhood home of Mark Twain. Not only is this the home Mark Twain grew up in, from whose windows and front door he could literally see the Mississippi River rolling by, but this little white house served as the inspiration for and the setting of the adventures of Tom Sawyer and Huckleberry Finn, two of Mark Twain's most beloved books. Tom Sawyer being a beloved classic that Mark Twain called a hymn to boyhood, and Huckleberry Finn being one of the greatest anti-racist novels of all time. These are two of my absolute favorite books of all time. And reading them over and over gave me not just a lifelong fascination with Mark Twain the man, but also Hannibal, Missouri the town. It may have changed quite a bit since Sam Clemens was a boy here in the 1830s and 40s, but thankfully a number of the original buildings from that time period have been preserved down near the boyhood home. So if you're willing to do some walking and some reading, and it helps you use a little bit of imagination, you can still see that boyhood town of Sam Clemens and of course his fiction alter ego Tom Sawyer. Actually it gets a little confusing between the world of Tom Sawyer and the world of Sam Clemens because some things are labeled fictionally like Tom Sawyer's fence or Becky Thatcher's house and some things are labeled in a more historic way like Sam Clemens father's office building or Grant's drugstore. But because all the adventures of Tom Sawyer and Huckleberry Finn were based on the boyhood experiences of the real life Sam Clemens and his friends it all kind of works itself out. I try to come out here as often as humanly possible. And even when I can't come, I try to keep my museum membership active. I love coming out here and imagining Tom Sawyer sneaking out of his bedroom window to join Huckleberry Finn, thinking about all the crazy nighttime adventures they had running around their town. Being in the place the stories happen just really brings them to life for me. And not just the stories in Tom Sawyer, but also the real life stories that took place here, which he used for other books or his autobiography. If you've read the adventures of Tom Sawyer, but have never read a Mark Twain biography, I I highly recommend it. Because some of the stories from Mark Twain's actual life here are just as, if not more fascinating than the ones he laid down in fiction. I just love the life story of the son of Missouri slave owners who would evolve over his long life into a champion for equal rights. It's crazy to think that this is the house where Mark Twain's mom tried to force him to take old timey Painkiller medicine made of all kinds of horrible, nasty stuff that he not only frequently fed to cracks in the floor, but in the books has Tom Sawyer feeding it to Peter the Cat, who, long story short, did not enjoy it. There's a lot of tragic stories with the Clemens family here in Hannibal as well. He lost siblings here, and most notably, the family lost their father. That happened when Sam Clemens was just a kid. As a matter of fact, even before his father passed away, pretty much leaving the family with nothing, they had already actually lost this house. They were living in rent rooms when their father died. Luckily, afterwards, they did manage to come back to this house, but when they did, it was no longer as owners, but renters. Mark Twain's sister, Pamela, spelt like Pamela, but not pronounced that way, gave music lessons in the house to help try to pay for the rent, and Sam and his brother, Henry Clemens, had to share their room with boarders. Basically, they had to lodge other people here that would pay rent just to keep the place. Man, 
This is crazy, sitting here in Sam Clemens' bedroom. Most people just breeze through really quickly, but I usually like to try to take a seat and sit here for a while and really soak it in. This would have been the very room that Mark Twain, as a young kid, would hear the crazy thunderstorms rolling by in and think that heaven was after him, ready to punish him for some unspeakable crime. It's been a while since I read it, but I believe this was also the room where he took a wasp's nest and put it underneath the covers of one of those lodgers they had, where he placed, as a prank, a live, full hornet's nest. Dude, pranks back in the day were hardcore. But then again, in those days, so was life. It's funny because we think of the stories in Tom Sawyer as sort of the perfect American childhood. You know, the old paint in the fence routine. Or winning the love of Becky Thatcher, the judge's daughter. But the real life Sam Clemens' childhood on which those stories were based was far from perfect. For starters, his father, John Marshall Clemens, was pretty much always a business failure. And although he was well respected and became the local justice of the peace. He was so bad with money and even worse at business that he not only lost a store and small hotel he owned on this corner over here at one point, but the family home as well. And like I was saying, the whole family had to move into rented rooms across the street upstairs in the old Grant's drugstore. And if that wasn't humiliating and tragic enough for the moment, not long after moving in, his father actually passed away here. Oh yeah, he died upstairs in one of those rooms, effectively ending his son Sam's childhood since he was soon put to work. I mean, there were still plenty of shenanigans and adventures here, like uh, dropping a watermelon onto the head of his brother Henry. But Basically, childhood was over and the work began. Thankfully though, for us Mark Twain fans, it was work that would change his life. First, he was apprenticed to the local printer who ran the newspaper right where this vacant lot is now. And later, when his brother Orion Clemens moved back up from St. Louis and started a newspaper in the bottom floor of their old house, Sam went to work for him, both setting type and also eventually writing in the newspaper. And eventually, to make a much longer and more complicated story short, because his brother Orion wasn't any better at business than their father and wasn't paying him. Eventually, Sam got fed up, made his way out into the world, and became Mark Twain. Of course, he would return to this town all the time in fiction, and this place inspired not only his two best-known and best-loved novels, but also a lot of other stories that made it into the non-fiction travel books, such as the time he didn't want to get whooped for sneaking out at night, so instead crawled into his father's law office to get some rest, and by the light of the moon, slowly came to realize there was a corpse on the floor. It was a guy who earlier that day got stabbed in the chest. And even 20 years later, while writing about his experiences in Europe, Sam would remember and record the story. Wow, they redid this whole building years ago when you used to come in here. There was a creepy dead mannequin on the floor. Ugh. That thing was awfully disturbing looking in a, in a fun sort of way. I wonder what happened to it. They should have gave it to me. I would have kept it. Anyway, stuff like that happened all the time. Mark Twain's dad once had to beat someone over the head with his gavel during a court session. Young Sammy also once saw a man get shot to death at point blank range, watched a hobo burn to death in the local jail, and saw several other friends and relatives die, including one who drowned after they were making fun of him for not being able to hold his breath long enough. Sam himself was the one chosen to swim down in the creek and feel around, eventually touching the dead boy's wrist. Mm. Well, there ain't nothing crazy about that. That stuff happened all the time. That's just young child. Childish, foolish shenanigans, right, baby? Oh, yeah. People got murdered here all of the time. Oh, yeah. We've seen lots of murders. No big deal. It was definitely frontier living back then. Life was a lot more gruesome for the real life Tom and Becky's. Anyway, I've told some of these stories before, and I'm sure I'll tell some of them again. As a somewhat crazed Twainiac, I am obsessed with the stories from Sam Clemens' boyhood, and I'm always trying to find old town maps to help me figure out exactly where those stories took place. Sort of an ongoing project with me. Who knows, someday maybe I'll write a book about it. In the meantime, I'm just here to enjoy this lovely day in Hannibal. I'm actually here at this time by Accident. Bad, bad, stormy weather was coming through. It was supposed to rain, thunder, lightning for three days. So I only came because I figured, well, might as well ride out the storm somewhere familiar. And then lo and behold, the rain stopped. So I got kind of a bonus Hannibal day. The perfect chance to catch up on some of the changes around town, like the fact that they demolished this building here at the foot of the stairs to the lighthouse. That is so weird. But what's even weirder than that building being gone down here is if you make your way all the way up the zillion stairs, they actually tore down and completely replaced the iconic lighthouse here. First lit 
all the way from the White House by President Franklin Delano Roosevelt to commemorate Mark Twain's 100th birthday. If I'm remembering all of that correctly, that was back in 1935. Ooh. You might be thinking, oh no! Now it's not the original. But to be fair, the original was knocked down like 50 years ago in a windstorm and it was rebuilt then anyway, so it's fine. Now as a history nerd, one of the things that always kind of disappointed me when I came here is that the river runs much lower and is much narrower than it was in Mark Twain's time. But this time, and I know it's kind of hard to tell, the river is running really high, so it's much wider than normal, making it a lot closer to the old Mark Twain days view of the Mississippi. That's the upside. The downside is that the river is so high they've closed all the floodgates. So the normal access to the river is all cut off. Ooh, it doesn't really matter though because I think there's a little bit of the Mississippi coming in right here. Oh yeah. Actually, it double doesn't matter. Because it turns out that Hannibal is in the process of completely ripping out and rebuilding their entire riverfront area. The statue of Mark Twain is still way out there wearing a construction vest. But pretty much every other familiar site is gone. This is really exciting though because part of the plan is that for the first time in ages, big River boats will be able to once again tie up at the docks of Hannibal. Which means you'll be able to take a riverboat cruise and step off onto the streets of this town just like Mark Twain did when he was working on the Mississippi River and popped in for visits. That is gonna be in Twain. Ooh, looks like the wind is starting to pick up out here and the sun is starting to go down. That means most of the historic attractions, such as the Mark Twain Museum here, are closing up. But that's okay, I've pretty much done everything on my list today except for the Cave. And that'll be open tomorrow morning, rain or shine. And in the meantime, as much as I love looking at Hannibal in the day, as a Tom Sawyer fan, I love it just as much at night. Whoa, totally different. Little bit more of a calm vibe at night. It's both wonderfully calm out here and kind of creepy. I love picturing Huckleberry Finn sneaking up to the back of Tom Sawyer's house, making those cat noises. And then young Tom Sawyer or Sam Clemens or however you want to slice it. The boys sneaking out of here and setting off through town on their nocturnal adventures. You can just picture them quietly sneaking along, tiptoeing it would have been through these very alleys. Back in the day, there used to be an old hotel over here. All that's left now is the old barn. True story, Abraham Lincoln once stayed at that hotel. And had his horse stabled here. Man, the only sound out here is the sound of that creepily green light. Whenever I'm out here like this, I become very hyper aware of the fact that this town is now 200 years old. And unlike the weekends when there's a lot of people down here for the bars, I strongly prefer nights like this when there's no one around but us and the ghosts. I don't know if you believe in ghosts. Heck, I never know if I believe in ghosts. But I'll tell you guys one thing I always do when I come down to Hannibal at night. I always stare up into the windows of the old Grant's drugstore where Mark Twain's father died. I'm just always looking. I mean, I'm pretty sure I don't want to see a ghost. But you always hear those ghost stories where people looked up into the windows of the old building and saw someone looking back. So I just can't help myself. Like, remember how the body of the stabbed guy was in here? If there was a ghost of Stabby McStabberson in there, would you want to see it? I don't know, but I can't help looking. It doesn't really creep me out unless I let my imagination start going really crazy. But I'll tell you the one thing that does creep me out every time. My number one nighttime Hannibal tradition. Just in case there's any Clemens family ghosts in there. And partially just to see if anything ever happens. I always make my way over here and knock on the door. Now obviously nothing's ever happened when I've done this. But no matter how many times I do it, I can't help thinking, what if somebody knocked back? Ooh, the creepiest part is walking away after knocking on the door and then forgetting that that Mark Twain statue's up there. <laughs> hey, Mr. Clemens. What do you think? You think ghosts are real? You think it's possible? I'm not a scientist or a professional death person. I don't know anything about the afterlife because I've never been there. But there is a strange thrill about being in historic areas after dark and letting your mind wander. Oh man, if you guys haven't ever read Tom Sawyer or haven't read it in a while, you gotta dig back in. That book is actually pretty creepy and wandering around here at night definitely adds to it. I guess I know just a little bit too much history and know the stories from Tom Sawyer a little too well. Drownings and death by disease. Doc Robinson getting murdered by moonlight in the graveyard. Oh yeah, it gets creepy. And if you think this is creepy, this is nothing when you remember that one of the places the boys would sneak out at night to go to was the cave. Alright, 
time to turn in for the night and sleep well. So that we can get in that old cave too. All right, good morning and welcome. To the Mark Twain Cave. We're only about five minutes by car from the Mark Twain boyhood home and only a couple of hundred yards in that direction is the Mississippi River. So it was an easy trip down river to this valley which is where they had all the church picnics and other gatherings just like the ones in the books Tom Sawyer and of course Huckleberry Finn. And as Mark Twain put it, the main attraction was the cave discovered exactly 200 years ago in the winter of 1819 by a local hunter whose dog ran into a hole in the side of this hill. Ever since Mark Twain featured this cave in the adventures of Tom Sawyer, tourists have been visiting non-stop. The price of admission gets you about an hour long tour through a big portion of the cave with a lot of twists and turns and many of the features described in the book The Adventures of Tom Sawyer. It's always 52 degrees in here as Mark Twain called it chilly as an ice house and walled by nature with solid limestone that was dewy with a cold sweat. He also said the cave was a vast labyrinth of crooked aisles that ran into each other and out again and led nowhere. It was said that one might wander days and nights together through its intricate tangle of rifts and chasms and never find the end of the cave and that he might go down and down and still down into the earth and it was just the same labyrinth after labyrinth and no end to any of them. It's crazy to think that the same cave Mark Twain was describing 150 years ago. Sick. I should say it's a little cold in here, but there's no steps, no stairs, no steep angles. It's all pretty much level. And except for the sound of the other tour guests shuffling around and the tour guide talking, it would be pretty darn silent in here. I've taken this tour quite a few times. It never gets old. There are a couple of cool, weird cave formations, usually lit up with different colors. But for the most part, it's just mile upon mile of these crazy lines limestone crevices and the main feature of being down here is the fact that it's the Tom Sawyer cave. I am really grateful for the electricity in here. I would not want to be trapped in here with candles like Tom and Becky. Especially because the cave is supposed to be haunted. <laughs> of this room. And keep in mind for you Disneyland fans, this is the original of the caves on Tom Sawyer Island, although slightly more impressive and a little less claustrophobic. But at least the one at Disneyland never had any bats. Oh gosh, this is the part of the tour where they turn out the lights to show you how dark it would be in here without the electricity. It's the only part that scares me. So who in here has ever read The Adventures of Tom Sawyer? Anybody? Okay. All of them? Okay. Well, Tom and his friends are having a picnic about where the parking lot is. That's when someone said, who's ready to explore the cave? So they all grabbed candles and started to explore. Now without electricity, that would look a little bit like this. Are you ready? Pretty dark. Now all the couples started going off two by two, and Tom had a huge crush on Becky. So they went off alone with just one candle for light. That would look a little bit like this. Now when they got where we're standing now, Becky was a little bit tired, so she leaned up against a wall. However, that's when she noticed that the wall that she was leaning up against was fuzzy, and it was moving, and it was squeaking. It was a wall covered with bats. They started to fly around, casting odd shadows on the wall, until one got a little bit too close, and total darkness. Oh my God. Now, your eyes can never adjust to this darkness because there's absolutely zero light to adjust to. Yeah. Actually, about seven or eight weeks in this darkness, you'll eventually go blind. Oh, fun. So it's so dark, right? You can't even see your hand in front of your face. So do an experiment for me. Put your thumb on your nose and wiggle your fingers. Can you see that? Well, I can. <laughs> <laughs> oh, here's the haunted part way back here. Too big of a tour group to go back there. But way back there is the place where one-time cave owner Dr. Clarence Nash McDowell, a surgeon from St. Louis, once tried to preserve the remains of his own daughter. He hung a glass and copper cylinder where he tried to preserve her body in alcohol back there. And the marks are still there to this day. Multiple tour guides have told me that they've actually seen the figure of a girl back there in the cave when they're in here alone. That freaks me out. I don't know much about the afterlife because I've never been there. But I definitely don't want to see any dead girls. Oh, oh I'm lagging behind. Wait for me. Just the fact that young Sam Clemens used to wander around here with candles is so crazy and interesting. Children back then were a lot braver than I am. <laughs> I think it's cool in here, until the group keeps leaving me. Then I gotta admit, I get a little nervous. Mostly just afraid that they'll turn out the lights. Ooh, we're in the parlor. Mark Twain called this the sitting room in Tom Sawyer. Ooh, story time. The only part of the cave where you can sit on the walls. Ooh, 
Oh yeah. Nice and cold. Especially on the rumpy areas. Ooh. They come in here and they sit down on the love seat. That's when Tom says three words that you never want to hear me say. He says, we are lost. And Becky was naturally frightened, so Tom thinks it's a good idea. He takes a piece of kite string out of his pocket. He ties one end to Becky's finger and he takes the other end off in the direction that will soon be heading in a second. About where that light ends. Can everybody see where the light ends? Mm-hmm. Well, he finds a drop off down there. And he sits on the edge thinking of what to do. He doesn't want to jump to find out how deep this drop off could be. It could be three feet, it could be 30 feet, it could even be 300 feet, and he doesn't want to jump to find out. So as he's sitting there thinking of what to do, he suddenly sees a light from the corner below him. He starts shouting for help. Maybe it's open to help him and Becky get out of the cave. But when he sees who's holding the light, he stops. Well, for those of you who have read The Adventures of Tom Sawyer, you might know that the bad guy at the book is none other than Injun Joe. That is crazy. That is the drop-off where Tom Sawyer bumped into Injun Joe. Of course, they smoothed out the drop-off for tour groups to walk down, but man, oh man, once you're in here, that whole section of the book where they're lost in the cave, which was already scary, becomes absolutely terrifying. And that's supposed to be a children's book. It can be a little bit slippery if you need to. You can hang on to our slide pipes. Slag pipes, that was a joke, by the way. I should mention that most of the stuff they show you on the tour are things they found after the fact that just sort of conveniently lined up with Mark Twain's description. But since Sam Clemens knew the cave well, some of them are pretty convincing, like this cross on the ceiling with a number two shaped rock below it. Really does seem like it could be the model for where Injun Joe hid the treasure and Tom and Huck dug it up later. A few of the spots in the cave, though, are definitely the ones described by Mark Twain. Like, for example, Aladdin's Palace. It's crazy coming to a landmark like Aladdin's Palace that Mark Twain actually mentions in the book, and knowing that he stood here as a boy, and that this is really the real-life Tom Sawyer cave. Ooh, he also talks about the cave having sweaty walls. Ooh, cave sweat. Ooh, salty. If you look around carefully, you'll notice there are tens of thousands of signatures in the cave, the earliest made with candle smoke, but in all these years, with all of these signatures that they've discovered, no one has ever found a signature for Sam Clemens. Even though he said he signed it in at least one or two spots. Some have been made with paint, some have been made with soot, like holding a candle up to the rock, some have been written with a pencil or a pen, some have been scratched out with a knife, and you may even see some red ones. Don't worry, it's not blood. It is berry juice. But keep your eyes open, you'll see lots of different ones. Another famous signature in here is Jesse James, but that's no longer on the tour. Oh, Headache Rock, wonder why they call it that. Oh, jeez Louise. Think, Justin, think. Oh, man. It's so weird when everybody gets ahead of you. You're kind of lost in the cave. The tour is almost over now, though, so this is really not the time you want to get lost. As much as I love visiting over and over, I would not yeah. want to stay here. And there's a lot of cool landmarks in here. The Devil's Slide, the Devil's Backbone, the Guiding Hand. Probably all very useful for finding your way back out again, if your candle was still lit. Oh, sorry, that's all I could think about in here. <laughs> Man, I will never forget my tour guide, Jamie, I had here a couple of years ago, was telling me all of the ghost stories. The most common is people behind the tour group, the last guy in line, like me, looking behind them and seeing that little girl. Man, I don't know why, but this a visit to the cave, I'm really letting my imagination get carried away with me. All right, if you're ever anywhere nearby, even St. Louis, it is worth the drive. I highly recommend this cave tour. Just make sure you read the cave chapters in Tom Sawyer first. I promise you, it will really enhance the experience. All right, well, time to return to the surface world. I don't know if I can adjust now. I'm a cave person. <laughs> oh, I should have said caveman. What was I thinking? Must have been that blow from Headache Rock. <sighs> Last one out. All right, well, another sick cave adventure complete. I have taken this cave tour five times now, and I am still not sick of it. Anyway, since the Sawyer Creek Fun Park and Choo Choo Twain are closed right now due to the weather and the river being so high at the moment, all that's really left to do is pay our respects to the Clemens family. Wow, amazing. Here are Mark Twain's brothers, Orion and Henry Clemens. And his parents, Jane Lampton, his mother. And his father, John Marshall Clemens. Originally buried in a different cemetery, he was the only one, I think, of this group that actually died here. But one by one, the rest of the Clemens family joined him. Sam Clemens last came here in 1902 to visit what he called his people. And never returned to Hannibal again, dying just eight years years later. He, of course, though, is buried beside his wife in Elmira, New York. Of course, while we're up here, we might as well pay our respects to the real-life 
Injun Joe. Joe Douglas, who in real life, although kind of scary in appearance, and that's why Mark Twain used him in the books, was actually a really nice, really friendly guy, and as his tombstone said, always lived an honorable life. All right, well, it seems like it's getting pretty dead out here. So I guess it's time for me to wish a hearty farewell to my favorite town in America. And just like Mark Twain after his last visit in 1902, go home and sleep well. Well, actually, first we're gonna head down the river to Kentucky. I'll see you there. My gosh, it was 92 degrees out here the other day, and now it's like 49 degrees. That is in Twain. <laughs> Get it? Because it's funny. People used to love jokes like that. They remember. They remember. I don't love you anymore, Tom Sawyer. Well, why, Becky? Because you got us lost in the cave. <laughs> Get you lost? Uh -huh. Well, I didn't I mean to get you lost. You oh loser. no! I'm gonna erase this. But I right love here. you. I hate you, Tom Sawyer. Oh. oh, I'm just kidding. I love you, even though you got me lost in a cave.